I'm Mario Martinez Jr., CEO and founder of Ingresso, and we are the creators of FlyMessage.io, the free personal writing assistant and text expander application. On each episode of this podcast, you will hear from sales leaders, practitioners, and influencers to help you grow your sales numbers at scale. So get your pen and paper or iPad and keyboard and start taking notes as you're now listening to The Moderate Selling Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Corn Ferry. Corn Ferry integrates their consultancy, Miller Hyman sales methodology, and technology to bring you Corn Ferry Cell for Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics 365. Learn more at cornferry.com forward slash sales effectiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Modern Selling Podcast. And I am with my friend, actually, Mr. Stephen Messer. He's actually the co-founder of Collective Eye. Now, you may remember Collective Eye back in 2018 and 19, actually. Uh, they put together a list of the top sales influencers. And one day, one day, I was literally walking at Dreamforce in 2019, and someone said to me, hey, you're in a magazine. And I said, what? I am? And uh, they put me inside there as one of the top 10 sales influencers in the world, which was pretty amazing. And I got a chance to meet Stephen and Heidi, actually, who have started Collective Eye. Stephen, man, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here after all those years. And I will tell you, that list was dead on. We were definitely right to put you in there. And you have proven that you are worth every minute of that, of that of being on every speaker's list and every podcaster's list. You should be at the top of that list. Bro, well, thank you so very much. I appreciate that. Uh, it was a, such an honor to be included in that. And it was great to get to know you since then till now. And I'm only sorry it took me so long to get you on my podcast. You should be. We, we should have been there a lot. We should be there every year. So from now on, promise me that we'll be here all the time getting to talk about all the new things going on in sales and all the data that we see about how sales is changing. Well, that absolutely. And that brings up a great point, which is, hey, tell everybody who Collective Eye is. It'd be great. And a little background about yourself. And then I've got one very special question that I ask all my guests. Awesome. Well, look, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, Collective Eye is just short for collective intelligence. We've been around for a while, focusing on bringing network tape capabilities to a salesperson's life. So this is why the, way, the Wall Street Journal called us the ways for sales. So we're real excited to be here talking a little bit about what we've been doing also just help people learn how to take advantage of some of the new tech that we're bringing to changing sales and making it better. Phenomenal. And uh, I've been watching your guys' progress at Collective Eye. You guys have done some amazing things. So do me a little favor and also tell us about your personal background. That's a great question. I, you know, it's funny. I work with my sister, uh, Heidi, uh, and I work also work with my brother-in-law. Um, which you might sound say sounds crazy, but we've been doing this for a long time. We've created a lot of companies that you probably know. For anyone on this podcast who's ever heard about affiliate marketing, that was Linkshare. We started that in, in uh, 1996. We ended up selling to Rockington. It's today called Rockington Media. We've invested in about 80 different companies. Uh, uh, we've ha uh, we sit on boards of public companies that we've helped start, like Spire Global and a whole bunch of other ones. So we love entrepreneurship. Mostly what we love is how amazing the world can be when it works together and innovates together. We can do great things. And that's always what it's all about. It's also what the name is all about, Collective Eye. So no doubt uh, spending some time here talking to sales leaders and uh, business owners, sales reps, marketing folks, uh, Stephen, you guys are clearly, you personally are clearly qualified uh, to be here because uh, you, you've done this multiple times with multiple companies and now with Collective Intelligence or Collective Eye. Uh, you've got um, uh, the uh, a great program that you've been running there with really gathering data. And we're going to talk about some of that today. But before I ask you that question to tell us a little bit about some of this data that we're going to be spending some time on, uh, everybody wants to know, tell us something nobody knows about you even if they're looking at any or all of your social profiles. And other than a confession, I'm looking for something juicy. Well, Mario, I would never tell anybody else this. So this is how much I love you and all you do for your, for your audience and the podcast, which is I was once beaten up by Willard Scott, the original Ronald McDonald. And, 
And he didn't beat me up because he was angry. He beat me up because I had broken my collarbone while skiing. We were sitting next to each other on a flight. We spent the entire flight talking. For those who don't know Willard Scott, Willard Scott was the news guy on Good Morning America for years. People loved him. He was the original Ronald McDonald. He was, he was the guy who called out every grandmother on TV and told her, wished her a very happy birthday. People loved her. And I'm on a plane sitting next to him, and I've got this all patched up from my skiing accident. He and I talking the whole time. And on the way out, he gives me an old boy slap in the on the rip, and I went down like a rock. So I have the joy of admitting that the original Ronald McDonald, the person that every grandmother loves, literally beat me up. What I want to know is what happened after you went down. Did he profusely apologize, help you back up? Did he Was he in shock, fear? Did he run? So he was a bit older and didn't necessarily know, and he was close to 6'7". He was massive. So he gets up. He, he says, Steve, I've enjoyed talking to you this whole flight. You really have made my day. I can't wait to keep up with you. Um, I'm going to go now. And he, we were right in the front row, and he gets up, and he goes, I'll, I'll say goodbye. And he hits me, and he just walks on. And as he walked on, I dropped like a rock. And all I can tell you is the entire plane, who had been paying attention to Willard Scott, the, the, the star that he was, the entire plane went quiet. And all I heard from behind me was, you take as long as you need. The entire plane saw my shoulder fly off my body and me fall down. And this nice gentleman not realize it and walk right out. It was hysterical. Oh, no. So he actually never knew. <laughs> <laughs> Never knew, and I'm happier that way because he was literally one of the nicest people and unintentionally beat me up, but it makes for a great story. It makes for a good story, that's for sure. Uh, well, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. I haven't had a story like that one before, so <laughs> fantastic, man. Well, listen, uh, you know, one of the things that we're going to be spending some time on is all around buyer, the sales organizations, and some of the things that are happening with agile sales and a turnover. So let's start with first, a lot of folks, as we come out of the pandemic, or we've come out of the pandemic, um, things have changed between sellers and buyers. More specifically, the buyer has definitely changed since the pandemic. Talk a little bit about how you guys are seeing the buyer changed and what that means to the sales organizations. Yeah, let me give some perspective because, you know, it's it's easy to say, hey, you're here, you're talking about what Collective Eye does, and uh, and why should I just uh, hear what you're saying? But the reality is, look, we track today about 5% of the globe's B2B economy. So we see a lot of what's happening. And I think if I told people on this call today that nothing changed, you'd be shocked. But the reality is everything changed. And I think that's the hardest part about what we see now going in, into COVID, it was already changing, but COVID just changed everything. So let's go through the litany of what changed. Work from home. Well, work from home didn't just mean that the deals were getting done in a distributed way. Work from home means that more people got involved because it was a video conference. They didn't have to physically be in the conference room. It meant that everybody was doing their own research because it was the only way they could operate together. It meant that a lot of those political binds that held everyone together to make decisions were no longer there. So new employees didn't know where to go or how to do things. Everything started changing, but I'm gonna argue that one of the biggest changes was our own fault. Well, when we started having to do no more in-person meetings, no more conferences and things like that, we started spamming the heck out of everybody. And when I look at the data today, what I see are no more bake-offs anymore. They're gone. People are now looking at time to value in a way they never saw before. Inbound is changing. In fact, I see almost no inbound anymore when I look across the customers that leverage us. The inbound rates have dropped to nothing. And when they do get inbound, it's kind of like people are treating it when they go shopping on e-commerce. They're putting in like hotmail addresses. They're not putting in their office addresses anymore. They're not putting their emails. I think it's because we immediately start spamming them. They get put in a cadence. They get phone calls. You know, uh, if I put a phone number into a list, my first cousin once removed starts getting phone calls asking why Steve isn't calling. And I think it's because they just got, we, we try to find a way to keep up with our customers and we're burning them out. So a lot's changing. And all of that is real implications on how we treat our buyers and how they're going to treat us back. So work from home, uh, more people involved in the sales process, both from the sales side as well from the buyer side. 
Uh, more research is being done because more people were involved in the process. Uh, spamming messages is what I heard you say. Um, has increased, uh, if you would, or email marketing, if you would, both from the salesperson as well as from the company, increased. Inbound is down. Sorry, that's number five. And then everybody starts getting thrown onto a cadence, and we're hoping that we can something will stick, if you would. Whatever we throw at a customer, something will stick. Did I get those right? You did, but I would say one thing. And we, we've used these tools too. So this is not me you know, trying to be holier than thou. I think we, we call spam cadences now. Right. That's exactly what we do. Right. And I think you change the word, but the same output, output is the same, which is nobody wants to start getting bombarded with messages and putting in Dear Stephen is not personalization. I think we've driven buyers underground. They are terrified that if they get involved in a pursuit, that their inbox will blow up, their phone will start getting spam dialers and things like that. And I think that's putting sales in a really dangerous and bad light. That's my personal sense. This is why we're very big pro proponents of agile selling. We think sales has got to change from this bombardment approach that is driving our, our customers underground. Yeah, well, you've heard me say before, buyers have gotten faster at buying faster than sellers at selling. And there's no doubt about that. I do not disagree with you at all. Uh, you know, one of the other things that I've noticed as well is that uh, the ability to speak to a buyer has dramatically gone down until they come out of hiding. Mm, let me explain. With the fact that majority of companies are allowing people to continue to work from home because they were able to identify that they could be successful without having people in the office all the time every day, uh, a lot of those tools like Zoom Info, Seamless.ai, Sales Intel, any of these tools which give you phone numbers and, and, uh, and email addresses, most of them are just tracking phone numbers related to office, not as many as for mobile devices. But even still, uh, what we're seeing is, is that nobody answers the phone. I, I do not answer the phone unless a caller ID shows up and I know who that person is. Period. And a discussion. And every message that goes in, I don't even listen to because if someone wants to get hold of me, they're going to message me. They're going to email me. They're going to text me. They're going to uh, um, uh, connect with me through LinkedIn. That's how I'm basically managing that. And voicemails, I will listen to once every two to three days. Look, uh, this is the cognitive dissonance that you get that most of the leaders don't. They will literally sit there and get angry if they get a phone call on their cell phone. They'll scream at the person and then they'll talk to their team about buying auto dialers and how <laughs> important it is to have 60 to 80 touch points a week. And not one of them looks at the unsubscribe rates. You know, I've, in fact, I've noticed that in all these cadence tools, spam bots, whatever you want to call them, all right, not one of them tells you your unsubscribe rate. And I look back to those days of e-commerce when I was back, you know, starting there and people got hooked on the crack of email. They got hooked on that crack because they're like, I can blast more and more and more out and I get more revenue. And what happened is there was a clip where eventually people were like, don't ever talk to me again. And today, that's exactly what's happening on, on mobile phones, on work phones, or on email, on every way they can try to infiltrate you. And I ask myself a very simple question. Why is it that most of these people are ditching us and hiding from us as best they can? And why is it that we've seen almost no bake-offs or just bake-offs disappearing? And what it is, is the buyers are going to each other to ask, how do I avoid this problem? by figuring out what to do. And they're getting some of these bad results because they're asking the same people. So no one's seeing what's really out there. But what's happening is they're just simply trying to hide. And there's got to be a different way. We would argue agile is one of the ways of doing it. But, but I would argue that the biggest realization that we have to get to is something that the, the, the hedge fund guys have figured out long before sales, but could be a really good lesson to sales. And I don't often say hedge fund guys and people, things to learn that we should follow, trust me. But what they do know is that, that when they run a play, that play is only good for a limited time. So if they're doing a trade and they're trying to do a certain trade on bonds or stocks, there's a limited time before everybody else figures out that trade and it goes away. 
sales never does. So sales figured out five years ago, cadences were, were better than leaving salespeople send emails out on their own. And now they've been blowing it away. Problem is everyone else is doing it. So that trade evaporated probably three years ago. And now we've just burnt through that trade and nobody can let go. And I can give proof of that. Proof, yeah, you? please expand. Answer, answer this question for me. Why is it that most sales organizations spend their days chasing the buyer in any way they can, bombarding them, doing whatever they have to do? And then I look at the big consulting firms where the company who's got a problem calls them up and says, I'm going to pay you a few million bucks to figure out what to sell me. Now, I want to be clear. You bring in a Bain, a BCG, a McKinsey, uh, any of the major players, you pay them a billion bucks. They do not come back at the end of that million bucks and say, I might be Bain, but I think McKinsey's better at solving this problem. They bring them in because they say, I know that you've solved someone's problem who's similar to me, that you're taking the time to understand me and figure out where exactly my problem is. And I know that you're ready to come in and help me out. Now, I'm not saying we have to come in and charge millions of dollars, but they're coming in and saying, before I give you an answer, I want to understand what's going on with you. And I don't mean superficial. I'm not looking for trigger words that tell me as soon as someone says, Steve, I heard you have the greatest forecasting product in the world, the collective eye. Can you help me? And I hear forecasting. I go, yes, I can help you with forecasting. How fast can I get you in this car and what can it be? I might need to understand, what are you trying to solve with forecasting? And why is it a problem for you? Can we spend time digging into it? And I think most sales organizations think, no, 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 no. That's not a repeatable sales process. I read predictive, uh, predictive sales. We're supposed to be doing these things quickly. And I think customers are sick of that. I think they really want to make sure that if you're going to be their partner, you help them because everything is fast and uh, to get live and get going now. But I don't know if it's going to work. And my time matters. That's, I think, the big change that we see coming out of COVID, I don't think it's going back to what it used to be. Interesting, you mentioned that. Uh, if I think about the last few purchases that we've made, uh, they didn't come as a result of us going out and doing a bake-off. They did not come as a result of us going out and doing a bunch of research. They came because I called up Johnny, Billy, and Susie and said, what are you doing to, and they filled in the blank, and I said, fantastic, do you like them, have they helped, did they say what they were going to do, and they said, yes, no, or maybe, or in between, if you would, and the maybe's in between, and I took the yes and the maybe, or in between, and said, will you introduce me, do you, would you recommend that I speak to them, and they said, yes, and I'll introduce you, and that's how that those sales came about. And with that in mind, I didn't have five vendors at the table. I had two. Two. That's what I had. So that I could look at the two different scenarios. And that was it. That, that's that's all I wanted to do. It was through what are you doing? And, and as you know, um, I have deep ties into the sales enablement or revenue enablement community. And I'm part of a discussion forum group that is active every single day where there's about 15,000 enablement professionals around the globe. And I see all the stuff that they're talking about. And it's all of this stuff that they say, please make sure that you don't, um, if you're a vendor that's part of the discussion group, don't reach out to me. I am only interested in practitioners, knowledge, and information. And it's amazing how many people are doing that because they're just asking, like, what did you do? How did you solve this problem? And the problem is sometimes they don't even know other than friendship. They don't even know if that person solved the problem well. They would still rather do that and go down that road. In fact, we've taken a very different approach to software. As you know, SaaS software as a service has been the dominant model that has been out there in the enterprise space. But we actually said, coming from the days of LinkShare, we don't want to do that. We think it's actually a cruel model. Why is it cruel? Well, it's cruel because it's basically like, buy my product, see if it works, and by the way, uh, every time you want it, you, you see value, you're going to charge you more money. So we took a very different approach. You may not know this, but uh, or probably you do know because you've met me before. But mo most of our licenses, we give away for free forever. Right? We, we believe this community model, which is we believe that if we work together, we win together. 
So part of that idea is that, that people will tell each other about what works and we encourage them to spread that idea because more people use our product, the better it gets. In my example earlier, where there's more people involved in the sale, we believe in this concept called deep collaboration. So if a seller is working on a deal and they need to bring in a lawyer or a board member, et cetera, they can bring those people in for free with the click of a share button. This is where we see the world beginning to change, which is it's about working together more effectively. It's about a deeper collaboration where they can actually help each other out. And it's also where the community can help provide feedback. So that community you just talked about, where you called up two people, well, imagine in my network that ways for sales where I'm using that to make sure the AI tells you if you're going to win or lose this deal, because I've learned from every other person who sold to that customer so that you can learn what I'm doing is not doing well. I'm pissing them off. Maybe I should change what I'm doing. That's the thing that we really get very excited about in this modern world, which is we're starting in sales to use data and advanced types of AIs to actually get personal with our customers. So let's start talking about this personalization concept uh, and the higher value interactions. Let, let me give you a little bit of scenario and then I'll, I'll wrap a question into this. And that is uh, just last week, um, we had a, a rep from a company um, sent out seven emails to Vengresso. Now, all seven of them were the exact same message. It just said, hey, Mario, hello, Vivica, hey, Jack. And the worst part was, is they actually sent it to uh, three former executives of the company it's whose right emails... Back. Yes, who e whose emails are are forwarded to me or to uh, one of our other executives in the company, and so uh, instantly we knew this was a spam all, and then the executives who who are here forwarded it to me because that would have been under my domain, and now I got seven email messages from the same person, and instantly you know like there's absolutely no interaction, high value interactions, no personalization. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, given the rise of inflation, fears of recession, everyone is focused on improving productivity, reaching their buyers. At the same time, you argued that buyers are expecting a higher value set of interactions. And I heard you say the word personalization. Is it possible to achieve both of those goals? Look, technology does amazing things. But again, going back to that cadence spam bot, Right, we all we all had them. We all used them. What that custom, what that seller taught you immediately was you were nothing more than a dear first name. That's what he told you. I don't care what your exact problem is. I don't care what your issue is. And the only people who cared for you, Mario, were the people you reached out into your own using your own network. They were probably the only ones who asked you, "What are you trying to do?" I'll tell you how we solved it. It's not weird. Like the fact that you have to go to your common friends to find out somebody will ask a question for you. Now, I'm not saying you can't do marketing, but Cadence tools are marketing, right? We have marketing automation and ABM and all those other things where I can talk about, oh, we're doing an event or a webinar, things like that, where you're essentially letting people know about things. We do probably one of the coolest events ever called The Forecast. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to our CI Forecast, but we have the greatest people in the world. Um, that you, that our, our community gets to spend 90 minutes with, uh, you know, from the founder of LinkedIn to uh, probably one of the most advanced uh, computer chip companies in the world, where our, our community can learn from. We let them know about that. That's what marketing tools are for. But when it comes time to understanding the customer, that's a different story. We spend a lot of time, as soon as we get that first meeting, we spend most of our time asking a lot of deep questions to try to understand what's going on. And did you know one of the things we won't do is sell you the product without you actually loading your data first? Because we don't want to sell you a product if we can't solve your problem. After discussing it, we think there's a problem. The first thing we'll do is say, okay, let's actually check it out and see if we can help you. Because I'm not here to sell you something. I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is and show you that when I look at your data, I am actually able to give you the most accurate forecast on the, on the planet. I am able to tell you which deals are at risk. I am able to help you figure out what's going on in those deals in a way you couldn't have done before. And then you can pay me. But, but even if you say to me, Steve, I want to give you a check. I need to make sure that our data works. 
I think there's something where you're going to the customer today and showing that you can actually listen to them and then provide value. That's why I gave that example to consulting firms. They're coming in, they're only taking that engagement, knowing they're gonna get paid a million bucks. If they know that they can help you at least have the high confidence in it. And then when they come in, they're showing before they do the expensive part of the project that yeah, they have found the problem, they know how to fix it and solve it, and they can show you an ROI for why it was there. I think that's the modern thinking about agile selling, which is I need to learn and I need to adjust because I do have to personalize it. Now, your question was, can you do it at scale? Only if you're using deep learning and a large network of data beyond yours. In no other area in the world does a company still rely only on their own data. You don't have search engines for you, right? There's use right. Google, right? You don't use your own map program anymore. You use Waze. Right. No, when you buy ads, do you buy it on your own website or put ads up on your own website? Or do you go and buy from one of the largest networks that are out there? Exactly. Nobody relies on their own data anymore except sales. This is why they're not able to do personalization at, at real length, right? It's why the network, like we try to fix the problems of CRM by buying LinkedIn by buying you know, a, a phone system that uses a network like Zoom Info, right? We rely on supplementing a core technology that's weak by trying to find wherever we can. Our model is a community model. We believe that, that we can learn from each other without giving away any confidential information. And that's why we're able to do such really cool things for our customers, whether it be forecasting, relationship mapping, or any of these things. The cool part is we can do that so quickly for you, but now show you insights you could never have gotten on your own. I love that model. And frankly, I don't know why people wouldn't want to be in a community. They're searching these communities out, Slack and Discord and everywhere else to find a way to get to each other, to help each other out. I don't know why they wouldn't want to help each other, figure out how to give a customer a better experience. So you've mentioned this concept of agile sales. I want to talk a little bit about that and what that means. But before I do that, I want you all to listen to this important message right now from our program sponsor. Corn Ferry understands talent, and in the sales world, it's no different. Corn Ferry transforms sales teams using their world class Miller Hyman methodology, employee assessments, benchmarking, and talent advisor capabilities to increase win rates and quota attainment. Corn Ferry offers Corn Ferry Sell a sales effectiveness app available in App Exchange and App Source that helps your sales team develop and replicate powerful sales strategies that help sellers win more deals and crush their quotas. Learn more at cornferry.com forward slash sales effectiveness. That's cornferry.com forward slash sales effectiveness. Right before that break, I was talking to you about agile sales. Actually, you were talking to me about that. You mentioned that several times. Uh, agile sales is being offered as an alternative to the traditional approach of people, process, and technology. First, can you explain what agile sales is and why is it a model that should be embraced by companies uh, to succeed? That's a great question. Well, let's just start with agile first, which is a concept that has really taken over first engineering in the old days of engineering and the old by the old days, I mean, 15 years ago. So this is how fast the world changes when something dominates like agile. But in the old days, people would design the software from beginning to end and they would want a consistent approach to delivering software and they would build it out the way they wanted to. And that had been the way software had been built since the dawn of the computers, the mini computers, everything you can imagine. And Agile came out and said, no, every time we do a short release, we learn something from the customer and we adjust. And the more we learn, the better we get. And even though each different development group might be doing on something different, each one's going to learn and move faster together. And Agile was so successful that when digital marketing came out, it moved from engineering into marketing. Today, if you speak to any one of your digital marketers who are running your teams, you will find that every day they're learning from uh, this influencer, they're learning from their, their ads that they spent on Google or somewhere else. 
And they're constantly adjusting with new information because their recognition is that the world is constantly changing. And so rather than start with this idea of, I have this big vision for what this year will be, they're immediately changing with new information and they're very data driven. And I don't mean the kind of data we talk about in sales. In sales, we talk about opinion in the form of data. Think about your forecasting call. Oh, I commit to that. Well, is that a dollar amount that's actually data driven or is that someone's opinion you turn into a number? Usually an opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. It is always in sales, we're always using opinions, right? Stages, well, stages have a fixed uh, a percentage on it. So if I agree that you've done your med pick check, you can change from stage three to stage four, and all of a sudden the odds go up. That's not numbers. Those are made up. Those are people's opinions that they put on there. That's not agile. You can never get agile with that kind of stuff. The idea here is when I'm looking at my Twitter, uh, uh, how many reposts I've gotten, I'm, as a marketer, able to look and say, this is the real data of what's going on. I'm able to do it consistently across these tools so I can figure out exactly how to make good decisions. And I'm adjusting because I presume the day day is going to mean that something is changing in the market. Let's think about sales for a second. Sales is so traditional that this time of year, we're now in mid-October, most companies are starting to plan all of next year. Well, let's do this time last year. What was happening mid-October of last year? Was there inflation? No. Bitcoin was going to $160,000 a coin. We were going to make a lot of money on Bitcoin. Russia was posturing, but they would never invade. Polio was a disease that wasn't going to be in New York. It was about to be eradicated, except for a few little villages left in some small places. But for the most part, it was a disease that we, for the first time, would say was eradicated. Monkeypox wasn't even on our mind. And if you had asked us about it, we probably would have thought it was something that, that monkeys got in a zoo, but gave to each other. Now, I could keep going because inflation was transitory. Should I keep going? Because no the keep... stock market was going to go down, did they? No, it could only go up. Inflation was actually something that they thought might have been gone forever. These were all things that took place this time last year. And how fast did it change? Literally, every month. like overnight, sometimes in some cases. And every month, it was like another wave of a new set of things that were coming. Gas pipelines were blowing up. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, we're talking about potentially nuclear war in a country that we thought was never going to happen again. I mean, you're talking about Belarus spreading. You've got war going on in the stands. It's like everywhere you look, something's happening. Now there's an, now is Iran stable? No, they've got teenage girls threatening to destabilize one of the largest countries in the world. This is just an example of things that are happening every few weeks, and they're not minor. But yet today, sales operations teams are about to sit down to plan all of next year. That traditional sales comes to an end with Collective Eye. Our belief is that you can actually get real data for the first time. We have a product called Intelligent Writeback that captures all the activities across your sales org without anybody having to do it, including the people like board members and finance people, et cetera. So you can get real good data, go from very low quality data, very low CRM hygiene, immediately up to date, but the AI is doing it automatically. That means I start getting real data. We can use conversational intelligence to analyze every single communication, phone, video conference, email, whatever, text, to use it and give you a consistent understanding of how each individual buyer is doing. Are they happy? Are they unhappy? Are they enjoying this buying process? You could do it across everybody touching every one of the buying teams across your selling teams. For the first time, we can actually understand at scale what's happening down to an individual level. And when you combine that with how this buyer has bought in the past from other people, all of a sudden, you have the ability to understand each day the happiness of the, of the process that the buyer is going through. And in the minute they're unhappy, change what you're doing. So as an example, <laughs> I wouldn't be that seller 
who sends out seven messages to seven different executives at one company, four of which are no longer at the company, three of which still are. Uh, and I wouldn't send them all at the exact same time. Uh, I would actually have some data that would tell me whether or not it's relevant for this individual, how this person has purchased before, and possibly even some data that would tell me how to personalize that particular message. With a little bit of luck, you wouldn't be spending uh, sending out spam emails anymore. And if it did, if your company forced you to do it, you'd be able to show them that every time we send these emails out, the odds of us winning this deal go down. Because then I won't go out there because you know what God happened? All those Cadence guys told us that it takes eight touches before they get to you. And when you get eight touches on the other side, like you described, you think, I know this company, but I don't want to work with them. Exactly. And I think we're going back in many ways to the days where we where sales was sales. We weren't going through and reading scripts, playbooks, and things like that. We're now telling them what we do. We're listening to the questions they have. And then we're starting to really dig into their problems. And we're getting feedback loops from the data saying, for this customer, they're doing a good job. I'm over-investing in a customer who's not interested. I'm under-investing in someone who actually wants my help. And I'm doing well. And then when I'm not, maybe all of a sudden now everyone jumps in and says, what happened? What went wrong? We need to listen to our customers. But to do that, you need data, a network, and the most powerful AI, which is called deep learning. Without that, you are playing this like playbook game till it's dead. And I think that's the big change that's going on. It's actually easier, more meaningful if you you let the data do your job, but it's different. And that's what you have to be open to. Now, I'll share one other thing. When I said you get a feedback loop, every morning when you sign into Collective Eye, you get your updated forecast without a single human being touching it, because that's the only way to get a consistently accurate forecast. I'll give you this question. I want you to imagine this. You use Waze. Of course, yes. Imagine if Waze gave you two options for their software. The first version of Waze, you download that app. And every time you type in your destination, it asks the passengers in your car what time you'll arrive. But it tells you how accurate they've been in the past. Do you use that tool or do you use version two, the one that looks at every driver on the road, never tells you where they live, never tells you their name, but learns from their journey and makes a prediction, and then adjusts when new information comes in. Which one would you choose? All day long, which is the reason why I use Waze number two. So why is it in sales that they still do every forecast Friday, asking everyone their opinion of what they believe? Because it's the gut, bro. It's the gut. You got to go with the gut. (laughs) That's the difference between traditional and agile. Agile says, I woke up this morning. And the deal I thought was good went bad. I can see everything that actually took place. I can see the communication. I can see the analysis. And immediately I'm going to wake up and say, Mary, I am so sorry. I realized we sent you seven emails and they were all identical. I just want to apologize on behalf of the company. We're working on trying to end that. How does that change your opinion of the company? Oh, I absolutely would have been like, no worries. No problem. I get it. I, 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 by the way, what do you do? Like if someone had actually taken the time for that, in the meantime, I unsubscribed from six of them, marked them all as spam, uh, except for the one that was targeted towards me. And uh, the one that was targeted towards me, I unsubscribed and marked, threw it into a folder called, so actually I unsubscribed from seven of them, but I threw it into a folder called emails that suck. Uh, and that's what that's the folder that I kept there for tracking all of these bad emails. Mary, you, you actually did that because you knew that by marketing his spam, the, their delivery rates will go down and you were helping your community because you're like, by getting their delivery rates down, I will actually save my friends from the same experience I had. Imagine that's what you thought. That's gonna- exactly what I thought. I'm going to, I'm going to impact their deliverability rate right? because of, of whatever stupid process they had in place that didn't allow the seller to think before they just hit go on a thousand people on a cadence. And how many meetings on those forecast Fridays are spent where the CRO asks the ops team or the ops teams ask what's going on and they say, what's our undeliverability rate and what's our unsubscribe rate? None. Uh, uh, marketing only thinks that way, not sales. That's the problem. 
That's what I mean by they're not data driven. In those, in those spam bots, they actually do have data. Those guys go out of their way not to show deliverability and they go out of their way of not showing unsubscribes. Both things are the thing that where your feedback, where you're finally getting feedback from those customers. Because I think if you saw that, all those spam bot tools, you'd be ripping out as fast as you humanly could. 100%. We're coming up on time here. I've got uh, just a couple more questions for you. And, and this one will be a, a fast one here. You've hit a couple of, you hit a point that I'm very much familiar with and something that I'm really cognizant about that, of course, as you know, in the Vingresso old days and our sales prospecting training, um, which we don't do the enterprise training anymore as turning into a SaaS company that I was very much focused on and helping sales leaders to think differently. So one challenge that we've seen is turnover is really at an all-time high in organizations. Some of it because people are leaving leaders, some of it because they're chasing after the extra twenty or thirty thousand dollars that a company offered them per year to be able to make more money. Others is lifestyle. They want to live anywhere they want. They want to work for a company that allows work from home, etc. Why, why, in addition to any of the reasons that I gave, what, what else? What are the, some of the reasons, and how does sales management change that? And this is our lightning round here. Yeah. So look, let's talk quickly. I mean, uh, if we're going to talk about why people are leaving. I would say first and foremost is if it, how efficient is the sales org? Because if I am expected to put things in CRM, one, I believe no human being should ever have to put anything into an Oracle database like Salesforce. Like, I, like the fact that I have to do data entry means you value my skill that low. Because in every other part of the world, we automated that away in the 80s. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, if you have me wasting time doing forecasting meetings where you're going to interview me and you're not using real tech, to help me figure out a win, that's a problem. If you're not allowing me to collaborate with all the teams so that I can see who else is touching my customer and what they're doing, we got problems, right? These are things where if I can get 20 to 30% productivity at another company, that's 20 to 30% more commissions I'm gonna make. Cause I only got so many hours in a day. So I'm starting to look and say, which companies are treating me like they're making me the superstar? And which ones aren't? Because I'm going to go to the ones that do. Because if they tell me I'm going to get, I'm not doing good rigor, I think to myself, why am I logging this when it could be done automatically? Now, the other thing I'm starting to think about is, okay, am I actually serving my customer or am I meeting their sort of thresholds of 60 activities? Because low value activities versus high touch points make a difference. And I don't think anyone's paying attention, but salespeople. Why? Because salespeople didn't come to this game to press a button that says Cadence slipped here. They came because they actually want to solve people's problems. They want to build relationships. And the last thing is, are they helping me build deep relationships? Because churn and turnover is not simply a seller problem. You got that on the buying teams as well. So I have to find ways to build relationships across those organizations, or I will never be in a position to actually be successful because I could be at the end of my nine month sale and find all of a sudden my customer is gone and I start all over again. So I got to build deep relationships. So you got to help me figure that out. And that's not LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn's LinkedIn to everyone's connected, but nobody knows anyone. So our goal is to really modernize the way we operate so that we can actually do what we used to do. Spend time with our customers. That's all that matters. There you go. Well, Stephen, if anybody wants to connect with you, what's the best way? LinkedIn, Twitter? You can get me on LinkedIn. You can get me on Twitter. I respond to everything. I work all the time and I love hearing from our community. Come join. Come join our forecast just by going to ciforecast.com. We do these events every week. You'll meet some of the most amazing people in the world. And by the way, feel free to try our product out. It doesn't cost anything to use our product. You can sign up as an individual contributor for free at intelligence.com or just write me and I'll get you all set up. And if you're, if you're a company and you want to figure out how do I do agile selling and you want to see it for yourself in under two weeks, I'll be able to show it to you and show you what a network and real AI can do for you. So if you want to connect with Steven, please get out to uh, LinkedIn, Steven, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Messer, M-E-S-S-E-R. And make sure you say you heard him on the Modern Selling Podcast. Please, Stephen, I got one more question for you. And that is your all-time favorite movie. What is it? I got to say it's The Godfather. I just watched The Offer on Paramount+. Plus, and if you haven't watched that, if you thought The Godfather itself was good, watching The Offer on top of it, 
will change your life. No better business school. Now, you may not know this, Mario, but I used to teach at Columbia Business School. I'm still affiliated there. But they used to have a class at Columbia Business School that was the most sought after class. And all they did was analyze the godfather for business advice. I will tell you, there is still to this day, no better business book than Mario Puzo's book. There is no better business movie than The Godfather. So I hope you and your team will watch that and watch the offer and you'll love it. There it is, The Godfather, The Offer. Uh, make sure you go out there and uh, watch that movie. For all of you listening in right now, hey, don't turn that dial just yet. We've got this very important message for you right here from our sponsor. Corn Ferry sales effectiveness solutions are increasing win rates by over 20%. Find out how they can help your sales team. Visit cornferry.com forward slash sales effectiveness. That's cornferry.com forward slash sales effectiveness. Thanks for listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Please do me a huge favor and give the Modern Selling Podcast a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Oh, and don't forget... If you'd like to save 20 hours or more in a month and increase your productivity, go right now and download Fly Message. That's flymsg.io for free. It's your free text expander and personal writing assistant. Hey, thanks for listening in. And until the next episode, good selling.